Why, what more might we see? Well, let's have a look and, and a bit of a think. At it. We'll go to the end of the chapter to begin with. John 9, I'm reading 39, 40 and 41. John 9, reading from verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, as we gather around your word and your works and your words, specifically, Lord, we just thank you for a wonderful, a wonderful insight and we just pray that you would give us this now also by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, there may be particular needs amongst us this evening. We would lift those up. There are a number that aren't here. We would pray for those of our number that are, for whatever reason, aren't here. <clears throat> Lord, we pray for... The, the two visiting girls in Grace and Vanessa, we ask your blessings upon them. Uh, Lord, we think of others our minds rush to that um, uh, pray for them and um, we think of the boy family and, and Rob and his particular situation at the moment. Pray for him and Serena. Lord, we, we're thankful we can gather around your word and, and Lord, we do so with great joy this evening. Lord, may you open up our eyes. May we stop and consider how good our eyesight is. And we ask all this in his wonderful name. Amen. I've said spiritual blindness is infinitely worse than physical blindness. So well, so how well do you see? How good is your spiritual eyesight? I want us to look at some clues that God may leave in the story for us. Turn John 9 verses 1 to 3. And as Jesus passed by... He saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. The works of God should be shown in him. Verse 1 tells us that he was blind from birth. In a very real sense, this man has spent all his life in a in a darkness, you could say a physical night. He's never seen the light of day. And, uh, all of his life, he's never seen the light of day. Um, it certainly wasn't his sin, Christ said, that put him into this situation or his, to cause his blindness or his parents. So why, is, we got this, why do we have this account in the scriptures? I believe it's a clue that God would have us to say, is there a spiritual application? Is there something for us to see of the works of God. Look in verse 3. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So he's telling us the works of God are going to be seen in him. There's something for us further to see. Dr. William Temple says this, This man blind from birth is every man. So it's no matter how youthful you are or how beautiful and intelligent or charming or young you may be, you have been born spiritually blind. We're all this man. We've all been born spiritually blind. And then in verse 1 it says, Jesus saw the man. The, war, the word saw means he perceived him mentally. He, he just didn't glance at his way and say, oh, what a poor man. He has a tragic life. He saw him. He, he perceived him. He saw who he was. He, he knew about him. It wasn't just a, an incidental look. The disciples, on the other hand, just glanced at the poor man and they remarked judgmentally. that well, Is he getting what he deserved or was this from the sins of his parents? But Jesus saw him. He saw him as a picture of every man who was born into the world, quite apart from from your own sins or the sins of your parents. And there's a lesson for us in that. Do we pass by people and say, they're spiritually blind? They've got no sense of God. They're not seeing God. They're spiritually blind. 
and they're people. They're people that can be known and they're people that can be understood. It's a tragic fact. Jesus saw the man as he really was. He was more than just a man. He was a particular man. Let's continue reading from verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is the day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am, in, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay out of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbours, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, oh, he, He's like him. But he said, I am he. Just consider for a moment. They say that we've got five senses. This man hasn't been able to see. He's got lost one fifth of the treasures that we all have. It was dead to him. We've got five senses. He hasn't been able to see anything. One fifth of all the things that we enjoy, he hasn't been able to experience. Um, he hasn't seen colour. He hasn't seen movement and and all of these range of things. And how true this is, even in the spiritual realm, that the spiritually blind have no understanding of the colour of the spiritual world, of the movement of the spiritual world, of, of the things that are happening in the spiritual realm. God's word tells us, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. A blind man was once asked to describe scarlet to a, to a blind man. So how would you describe the colour scarlet or a, a bright or a vivid red? What can you compare it to that is not in the, in the realm of eyesight? He said, the blind man said, is scarlet like the sound of a trumpet? Probably is, isn't it? Sort of a, you know, sort of a, it's, it's, how, how would you describe it? How would you describe something that you've never seen? Is scarlet like the blast of a trumpet? How would you imagine scarlet? How would you imagine red? Would you try and confine it to a noise or... What can you compare it to outside of the realm of visual things that you already have? And so it is in the spiritual realm. How do we describe spiritual things by earthly things? How can we describe things that are material, I'm sorry, spiritual, by material things or by uh, things that are uh, immediate in front of us? Because... Men that are blind to the things of the Spirit will just dismiss the pleasures and the treasures of the Christian life as foolishness. I've got no understanding of the joy of being in Christ, the joy of having eternal life. And they have no idea of what they're missing. They have no idea that there is a spiritual realm, that, that there is a God on the throne. We can ask ourselves a question, do we find our spiritual life a little bit dull? Maybe we need to clean our glasses up because the reality is there is a spiritual life for all of us to see. In verse 6 we read that Christ spat on the ground and in verse 7 he made some clay. The man washed in the pool of Siloam and he returned seeing. Christ had met the blind man and was made, the blind man was made to see. We would say in simple language it's a, a miracle. Christ had done the supernatural. He's done the out of the ordinary. But it's not an out of the ordinary for God. How would the man explain what has happened to him? We're in John chapter 9. Let's continue reading from verse 8. The neighbours, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, 
how were thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I I know not. They brought him to the Pharisees, him that was aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay on mine eyes, and I washed, and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such a miracle? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son whom you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. And that's no small thing to be separated from their community. Therefore said he, his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise, we know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. All the man could do was to describe what had happened and leave the how to Christ who had touched his eyes. He could just say, well, this is what's happened. Have again a look at the the clarity of Scripture. Have a look in verse 11. And he answered, A man that is called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received my sight. So there was a divine side to what's happened in this operation. He's made the clay. He's put it on his eyes. How simple. Yet how very profound. Not only did what Christ do was real and effective, it's symbolic in even a deeper reality. This is the only recorded occasion when Jesus took the initiative in restoring sight. That he's gone out and sought the man out. This makes it even more significant in symbolism. He's mixed his own, his own spittle, his own saliva with the clay and it's like he's mixing of himself with humanity and he's going to put it on the man and, and he's anointed the man's eyes and, and in the same sense Christ has come down from heaven and he's taken on a human form, he's mixed himself with humanity, with an earthly body and by doing that He's able to heal us. He's mixing himself with humanity that he might impart eyes, or might impart life to the eyes of men. Hebrews 2.14 For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus, God the Son, mixed himself with man as the son of Mary and as the perfect man went to the cross that we might be delivered from the blinding power of the devil, from the deception that leaves us in spiritual darkness. Why saliva? We may not think too much of it. It's said that in the East, saliva represents a man's essential nature or being to use one spittle in healing suggests profound sympathy. We know that, of course, there's antiseptic qualities in it. But there's this a human application to a divine operation. He wasn't healed on the spot. 
He wasn't healed on the spot. Verse 11 tells us. John has already told us in verse 7 that the word Siloam means sent. The pool of Siloam was specially provided pool of water for ceremonial drinking and cleansing. The priests would draw water from this pool to put it into a silver basin by the altar where it was poured out in a ceremony. And while they were pouring out this water from the pool of Siloam, our Lord Jesus Christ on the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7, he likened himself to those waters from the pool when he cried out, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. That was water from the pool of Siloam being poured out when Christ would say, Come unto me and drink. So the blind man went, he washed, and he received his sight. He accepted Christ's method of spittle and clay in his eyes. He obeyed his part to wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent, and then he could see. Similarly, if you would have light in your darkness and sight for your blindness, you have to do it God's way. Follow the divine operation. You need to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross You believe that? You believe that he finally and completely handled the problem of spiritual blindness? You accept that he's paid the penalty, you accept it by faith and you receive it to yourself. And part of that is this big area of cleansing. Cleansing by the water of the word. A lot more could be said about that. Let me give an illustration this is, I know this is an old one now, for spiritual sight. It's now quite commonplace to have cornea grafting operations which can give people sight. But in the early days, Saturday, January the 27th, 1951, the Daily Graphic reported the thrilling story of one such person who received his sight. The man was Hendrik Botha, or Botha, a 30-year-old former clerk who had been blind for 10 years. At the expense of a little church in South Africa, he was sent to the famous Manhattan Eye Hospital. The day he arrived in New York, a man died in Michigan. At 2am the next morning, the surgeon removed the cornea of the blind man's right eye and grafted in the replacement from the dead man. It was a success. Later that year, a similar operation restored the sight of the left eye. (laughs) Then it goes on with great joy and thanksgiving he returns to South Africa He was going to see his devoted wife and two small girls for the first time. For the first time. Now that he could see. That's the gospel of spiritual sight. Jesus healed the blind man's sight by a miracle of spittle and clay. But Jesus has also given life that we might see. He's completed the operation, but you have to affect the application by coming to him and receiving it and receiving the sight which he makes available through sacrificial light. In John 9, 5, Jesus says to his disciples, I am the light of the world. The blind man had probably heard him then and wondered what it meant, but now he can understand. Now he knows. The blind man had received more than physical sight. There was something that he could now see with certainty. Have a look at John 9.25. And he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. But one thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. One thing I know, and I, folks, I would think his eyes were sparkling Yeah, he was excited. I I can see, I'm confident. He was sure of himself. You know, and it's hard to argue with a man that has come before God and he's been changed by God and he's welling up and said, I know something has changed and I know it's not bad. This is something that's good and it's from God and it's changed me. I know that I was blind before and I know that now I could see. It doesn't matter what theological arguments you put up against it. It doesn't matter what you say against this man. He has the power to heal. 
He has the power for, to open up people's eyes and allow them to see a man called Jesus had opened my eyes. You and I know that often Christianity is spread more by testimony than just theological argument. It seems that the word of our testimony that talks about in Revelation is a better way of getting the gospel out than just discussing and trying to put truths out by it. We need to be able to say what God has done in our life. Esty Gordon tells of a Christian woman whose age had began to tell on her memory. She had known much of the Bible by heart, and, but eventually her memory is starting to go. One verse stayed with her till almost the end. I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he was able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. But by and by she started to lose even that. She couldn't say anything more than she was going on, that which I have committed unto him. And just before she was about to die, she was be saying, him, him, him. Oh, look, her mind couldn't put it all together like she used to, but it was about Christ, him. That's all she needed to know, Christ, him. She'd lost the Bible, her memory, but she remembered Christ. With spiritual eyes, the blind man was now certain of the facts. Let's continue reading from verse 25. He's certain of his facts. Verse 25. And he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they unto him again, What did he do to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you be also his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, here it is a marvellous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshipper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. <clears throat> and some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words <clears throat> and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. Verse 28 says the learned hypocritical churchmen reviled him. You get a picture of Christ and often there's people in churches will revile. They'll say, oh look, we don't understand you. You're excited about the things of God. You're upsetting our status quo. Jesus was often rebuked. Um, James and John saw a Samaritan village. They, they, they would not receive Christ and they wanted to call down fire from heaven and destroy the village. And Jesus would say, you, you know not what manner of spirit ye are of. And then he would say, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives but to save them. <coughs> it was not of Christ. We need to get a vision of Christ to see men properly. Otherwise, 
We look at people saying, well, Lord, why don't you just bring judgment on them? Lord, why don't you do this or why don't you do that? Those religious leaders refiled this man and yet he just had a miracle upon him. He, he's, seen, he's excited about the things of God. We need to be keeping our focus right and, and having a heart and knowing what our spirit is of that we might be excited about the things of God. We can fall into the same danger as the Pharisees and, and lose some of that excitement and think, well, look, this is about how we act and, and, and lose the sense of where we should be. Now the synagogue, his parents and friends were all to cold shoulder him and finally excommunicate him. That's in verse 34. <clears throat> it ends and they cast him out he was cold shouldered he was excommunicated from his family from all there that was for a Jew the greatest possible shame I mean it's not like he could go to another church or another synagogue or anything else but he remains unshaken he's constant he's, he's still on fire <clears throat> what a a great witness he is. You know, we often read of the persecution going through North Korea. Even North Vietnam has had a great deal of persecution. Our ex-blind man has the answer in verse 33. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. He had his focus on God. Since 1990, North Vietnam's tribal people have turned rapidly to Christianity, responding to gospel messages on radio broadcast in their own language by the Far East Asia Broadcasting Company. But the count goes on. Because it's seen as an American religion, <coughs> the Christians are beaten, they're tortured, and they're forced to return to their animist rituals and forced to return to the worship of demons and Many have fled. Many of the counts of torture and uh, long imprisonments. But folks, we also read that they've got a vision of Christ. They've got a vision of the gloriousness of who Christ is and what he can do. It's like they're saying, one thing I know, now I can see. They're excited for the things of God. What did this man see or, or understand? Have a look in verse nine, chapter 9, verse 11. And he answered, a man that is called Jesus. A man, just a man called Jesus. Have a look in verse 17. They say unto the blind man, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He is a prophet. He's a prophet. And then verse, look in verse 33. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. This is a man of God. And all this is moving. We can see this. He's just a man. He's a prophet. He's a man of God. It's all bringing him to the place where he meets Christ face to face. He says, Lord, I believe. Where are each of us in that progression? Do you see Christ as just a man? Do you see him as a, as a prophet, as something more, that is a great teacher and we've got his book and great truths to live by? And plenty of folks are like that. Plenty of people will go to the Beatitudes and say, oh, these are the greatest lessons that we could ever have. Blessed are they that he's just a great teacher or he's a sent from God, he's God's man. Where are we in that progression? Now it's very interesting. Some of those that uh, have had eye operations, often they bandage up the head and over a period of time they start taking the bandages off to slowly allow the light to come in so the muscles and things can slowly strengthen themselves. God does that with us. He takes a wrapper off. He takes a little bit of the, that which would hold the light out and bit by bit he increases the light so that we can get more clarity, so that we can get more vision of who he is. What if someone says, what if I do not confess my blindness in sin? What if I don't confess my blindness in sin? 
they'll remain lost. Unless you're trusting Christ by faith, unless you can see that you're a sinner and you call out to him, unless you can see, you can say, look, oh Lord, I repent of this, I'm caught in this lifestyle. Unless you can see that happening, you've got the light shedding in onto the darkness, you'll still be trapped in it. We'll be like the Pharisees, we'll be comfortable in their lack of spiritual vision. And that's why we have such a rebuke at the end. Look again in verse 39. For judgment I am come into this world that they which see not might see and they and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Jesus is saying if you own your spiritual blindness, then you confess it. You acknowledge it and Christ can give you vision. But if you think you've got it all, it won't come and you won't come to him. You won't confess your blindness and you will be blind. It's like a picture of the laity to see in church that they were blind and naked and they didn't know it. And This is a tragedy that we can have in churches that we can be blind. We think we're seeing clearly and we're not. Do we have enough eye salve, salve <clears throat> to be able to, to put on our eyes for us to see as, as we read in Revelation? I'm standing up here preaching. I wonder sometimes how blind I am. I mean, how much more should I be seeing Christ? And you could all be asking yourselves the same question. May the Lord never have to say to us, as he said to the Pharisees in verse 41, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see. May he never say to us, well, you think you see. You're Christians, you can see and understand. To say that you see when you're in spiritual darkness is to seal your doom in sin. May God save us from such an end. Christ mixed himself in the clay and performed the first part of the cure. But the blind man was still sent to the pool sent and washed in the waters that represented Christ, the living water. And we're all to come to those waters and wash the waters of Christ for cleansing and for vision. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we just thank you for who you are. You're a great God, a wondrous God. Lord, may we not be blind to our own selves. Lord, we, may we look in the mirror, as was spoken about yesterday, and uh, truly the mirror of your word, the perfect law of liberty, and to see how we really are, and then confess and move on and grow stronger in you. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you praise you, ask your blessings Lord there will be much happening this week we mentioned the tailors we pray for the overwheels as they pack and go and leave on Tuesday night, give them journey mercies may they have a wonderful time of fellowship with Matty in England, may they have a good time in Ireland and, and, uh, and Holland and keep them safe, bring them back Lord we're mindful of the various tragedies around the world we don't wish to take safety for granted. Lord, there's others that we can think of with particular needs. We think of Roger Bradley that was out this morning and struggling in certain areas. And Viv, we ask your blessings upon her. Lord, we pray for the youth group and uh, the youth camp and our young people. Lord, I pray that you might raise more up and uh, may we be keen about the things of you and excited. Pray for this church that... You would grow her in every sense. Lord, we might grow in love for you and love for each other. That we might grow in zeal for the things of you. Lord, we pray for the offerings that they might grow also and we can use them as stewardship, Lord, whether it's investing in youth or investing in whatever it might be. Lord, in all these things, we pray that we might be a church that is healthy and growing and we look to you, for without you we are nothing. Lord, I thank you we can bring these petitions before you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.